We don't always have the imagination to know what are humans going to do next, but somehow we always find something new to do, something new to tackle. And generally speaking, it's the technology we developed that not only frees us up to be able to do those things, but also often spurs some of the creativity. There will be displacement, but there'll be something new. Brewing in the background is quantum computing, which I think will also have another set of major ramifications to what we're doing. That is going to make AI even more possible, but I think it could have impacts we can't even imagine. I'd love to welcome Carol Myers to the show. Carol, welcome. Thank you, Drew. Really glad to be here with you today. Awesome. So what I'd love to do, Carol, just to get uh, the audience getting to know you a bit, could you maybe take a minute to introduce yourself and tell us how you ended up as a partner at Glasswing Ventures? Yeah, happy to. Nothing I like better than telling my story. <laughs> I've been a career sales and marketing executive in tech for decades. So that's really, I define myself in those terms from a business perspective. And it was really through that, that I ended up joining Glasswing. So I was the chief marketing officer of a couple of companies here in Boston, mm -hmm. Unica, Log Me In, Rapid7, got to take all three of them public, met Rudina Ciceri, who's the founder and managing director at Glasswing at a breakfast that was held by the United Way. And we just hit it off. And so when it was time for me to hang up my CMO shoes and not be a CMO anymore, and I wondered what to do next, there was Rudina with the idea that perhaps taking what I'd learned as a operator in the world of technology into investing in the world of technology might be a good pathway. And so that's how I ended up doing that. But I also sit on a number of boards as an independent board member. I do some executive coaching and I also do some consulting. I round it out with a whole lot of things that keep my mind very active and growing. That's fantastic. So yeah, I'd love to. You, you have an amazing vantage point right now right, as a partner at a VC firm in tech, helping some of the most intelligent and technologically gifted individuals, right? So what are some of the most popular problem spaces being tackled right now? Yeah, it's a great question. So my vantage point is focused on AI. So Glasswing only invests in AI B2B enterprise SaaS. So it's a great. little bit narrow. There's a lot of things going on outside yeah. of that, but that's just to set the context about what my worldview is. And obviously I think AI is going to have a sweeping of, of impact equal to, if not stronger than the internet, which per mm. every part of our life is, I think, touched by the internet practically. So every industry is getting impacted by AI, but the things we're seeing, are, there are a couple. There's generative AI, which I think many people have played with. I've played with it. I'm sure you've played mm -hmm. with it, but it's only one type of AI. There's also physics-informed neural networks, which is using machine learning, but making sure you're feeding into to it, the laws of physics, <laughs> so that the AI does not go out and come up with some wonderfully creative solutions, which defy the law of physics and therefore don't work. So for example, that's really important in manufacturing. And we work with a company called Base2, which is really revolutionizing a lot of highly regulated industries like biopharma, oil and gas, aerospace, because what it does is it creates a twin ops platform using this idea of physics-informed neural networks to create a way for process engineers to visualize their end-to-end -end process and experiment with it and test things and optimize it over time. And so that's like one example outside of generative AI and having a lot of fun, you know, chatting with ChatGPT, yeah. that AI is having real impact today. And we see this across supply chain, cybersecurity, very much. And then there's a whole crop of companies which are also investing in, and that is growing pretty rapidly, which are just designed to help people take advantage of AI faster. So it's really intensive work to build those models. And it takes data engineers and data scientists and a whole group of people that a lot of us have never even been aware of and time intensive to build the models that are making these kinds of inroads into other industries. And so we invest in that as well, like FeatureByte, 
which is automating some of the processes around building your models, in particular, wow. finding what they call the features, which are those, those data points that are going to have the biggest impact on the models that you're building. Absolutely. Yeah. And thanks, thanks for all that insight. The Physics Informed Neural Networks just sounds fascinating. And you started off talking about how generative AI is only one type of AI. There's this fervor about AI right now, but just curious. And, and you said since the internet. And so I look at those as like major, like replatforming that we're doing right as economies before internet, it was computing. And so if you look at internet and you look at AI to you, when you look out on the horizon, what are the next possible major platforms? Beyond AI, yes. the other thing that is brewing in the background is quantum computing, which I think will also have another set of major ramifications to what we're doing. Um, Gordon Moore passed away not too long ago. And of course, he was the father of Intel and this whole idea of Moore's law. And that's been pretty steady. But quantum is going to make a quantum leap as in the name. Yeah. And that is going to make AI even more possible. But I think it could have impacts we can't even imagine, possibly in space and in so many frontiers that are still new to us. Probably climate as well, yes. if yeah. you think about how much data and, and what it takes to really understand what's happening with the climate, I think we could see some really big impacts in those areas. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I've been fascinated by, especially with generative AI, is it's almost like the way I think about it is this is what robotics has been waiting for, <laughs> right? It's like robots yes. have made it to a point, but it's like we can only go so far. But now that we can actually program with AI it's like opening this world of robotics. Does that align with your thinking or? Yeah, I think it does because the robot, obviously there's still some physics to the robots, but that ability to really apply analytics to how they move, I think will be incredible to moving that forward. And we're starting to see those things come together. For example, another company is Retroquasal, which is using computer vision, which are you can use off-the-shelf cameras and AI yeah. to help again improve manufacturing processes, whether it's humans or robots doing the activity, being able to monitor that and quickly identify ways that you can make it more efficient, more safe, all of those kinds of things. Absolutely. Going down that path of manufacturing, there's almost a bit of a renaissance, it seems, right? Bringing manufacturing back to the U.S. In the 90s, we saw a ton of globalization, right, with internet technology. And I think even mobile exploded it more. And so it's what's old is new again. Are you seeing a lot of that happen? I am seeing that. And I think it was maybe two or three years ago, Mark Andreessen put out his famous blog post yeah. about why don't we make things anymore. And I'm now in, also involved with a company called Mark Forge, which does additive manufacturing or 3D manufacturing, but not prototypes, which is what everyone sure. thinks of it as, but real parts. And that is also helping fuel that because now I can print wherever I am. So why would I print you know, <laughs> somewhere else when I can make what I need right here? And so I think there is a renaissance in people also realizing, especially maybe again with AI, thinking about yeah. what's that impact going to be? Maybe there's value in real tangible things as well. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So when we think about AI, we think about the, the impact, a lot of news stories. I'm just, you know, I'm not baffled because it makes sense. There's a lot of fear mongering in the media, right? If it bleeds, it leads the rise of the machines. And so we're hearing a lot of coverage about AI replacing workers. In February, the World Economic Forum released an estimate that they believe that AI could displace 80 million jobs. The same report shows that it will probably create 90. I think it'll be over 100 million jobs fueled. How do you see this unfolding and what should we be paying attention to? It's such a great question. And I think I'm not really smart enough to know what's going to happen. But I, if I look to history, we've been through this a billion times, right? When the printing press came out, what are those writers going to do? <laughs> exactly. 
everything that's ever come out, we've always worried about someone does that today, those people are all going to lose their jobs. Manufacturing is still a thriving business, right? And everyone thought there would be no more manufacturing. So I think we don't always have the imagination to know what are humans going to do next, but somehow we always find something new to do, something new to tackle. And generally speaking, it's the technology we developed that not only frees us up to be able to do those things, but also often spurs some of the creativity. I think we're going to see that. I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but an awful lot of AI is around assisting people to do their jobs better, not necessarily completely replacing their job. There will be displacement, but there'll be something new. As we always need to do, we need to be thinking about how do we retrain people? How do we help people learn and grow? Yeah. And I'm very excited that my son is going back to school. He's going to go get a degree in AI because he sees the importance of that and not resting on school from five years ago, right? Let's go out and get a new degree and be ready for the what's coming in the world. And I think we're all going to need to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was chatting with with an economist two weeks ago, and we were talking about there's actually some job spaces where you can enter the market, and it's actually STEM jobs. More often than not, STEM workers enter the market ahead of their peers and their cohort of graduates, but the degradation in value is precipitous. It just falls really fast if they don't stay up to speed. So reminds me, it's great that your son is doing that. That said, curious to get your vantage point coming up in sales and marketing. One of the spaces in business that looks to be very much impacted by AI is sales and marketing. Give us a tangible scenario of how AI is perhaps displacing, but also augmenting workers in that space. Yeah, I was telling, I went out with a group of friends last night for dinner and I told them that how I personally used it. And I can see, for example, content managers in marketing using AI this way. I needed to write a press release. It wasn't a very complicated one. (laughs) In fact, it's one that just went out on the wire this morning. And I used ChatGPT to give me my first draft. And it was actually, once I learned to prompt a little better, it was pretty good. I did some tweaking to it and off it went because it was relatively uncomplicated. What else did I use it for? I used it to improve my board bio. I fed it in and I said, make this better. (laughs) And it did. It came back. I was like, oh, that is better. I like the way you phrase that much better. Thank you very much, ChatGPT. So I see content in marketing is one of those things people always want more of. Perhaps there's going to be too much. But if you are are a small company and you can only have someone per time or you can only have one content marketer, but you feel like you need more. Well, now you can free that person up because they can start to put some tasks to chat GPT. I almost envision it as chat GPT is the writer and the content person becomes the editor. They're choosing the stories, they're editing the stories, and they're able to produce a whole lot more. And they can put their time and effort into the things that are going to be a little harder initially for ChatGPT to churn out and let ChatGPT do some of the lower level work. (laughs) Right. Yeah, absolutely. And here on this show, we talk about that phenomenon, right? That as machines continue to take on the more transactional or objective components of work, us humans are left to do the more relational or subjective components. So when you think about that, what are humans left to do if machines are doing all of those other things? I ponder this a lot because relationships, everyone needs relationships, but some people need more than others. Right? For some people, the relationships isn't their best skill. And so I think there will be other things. I think we see a lot of with DALI and different things happening where AI is also generating art that people like. But I think what we'll start to see happen is there's going to be a renewed interest in and a increased value in things that are actually created by humans Hmm. versus machines. So I think that's going to be, you know, one thing that we will see continue to happen. Yeah, I still can't make physical things, so we can make physical things. And right now isn't doing decision making and deciding what to do. And I think that will be the realm of humans for quite some time, right? Over time, there might be some decisions we'll start to delegate to our AI as it gets better. I don't think it's there right now, but I think there'll always be this element of humans deciding, creating, thinking, visioning new things, and then being able to use the technology to bring to life 
what's in their imagination. So we're in thinking about that, right? Humans are going to be celebrated or even coveted for their human abilities and traits more so in the future. How does this influence how you think about the, the skills, what kinds of skills and competencies that the next generation of workers will need that are coming out of school? Yeah, it's interesting. Well, I, I do think they should learn about AI for sure. Anything that's big and going to impact the world, it's important to, to learn about it. And by the way, you don't have to go to school for it. You can, there's so many great resources. In fact, Rudina, who I mentioned earlier, puts out every week something called the AI Atlas. And it explains things like physics-informed neural networks, which sounds really scary. So I think sometimes people are like, oh, that looks technical. But she breaks it down in human language so that you can understand it and why it's important and where it might be used. So I think everyone should be learning and curious about the things that are happening in the world around them. And then it goes back to, I think, some of the same things that you've always needed to be super successful. And that is that ability to learn and adapt. Yeah, which is ultimately what we as humans are best at. And it's one of the key things I always look for in the people I hire almost doesn't matter what the role is. If I have the choice, I'd rather hire someone who's focused on learning and growth all the time, who's curious, who's open, who's seeking feedback, who wants to try new things than the person who doesn't because the person who is a a learning being and, and emphasizes that I'm hiring them for a job, but they will invariably be able to do other jobs. And therefore I'm making a huge investment in someone who I can see being in my organization or in my life for a very long period of time. I love that concept of who is a learning being. That's great. Speaking of upskilling, retraining, where do you think the obligation lies? Is that something that like the government should oversee? Or do you think that businesses, corporations have an obligation to upskill and retrain workers? I think the who has the most obligation is ourselves. And I believe that overall, I'm one of those independent, you got to take responsibility for yourself kind of people. Number one, it has to be you. You have to be seeking it out. And then there's how can people help them? Do organizations have an obligation? I don't know if they have an obligation, but if they're smart and they're trying to build an organization that's going to live for a long time and be a leader for a long time, then they're smart to make that investment. So are they obligated? I don't know, but they certainly should be doing that because they are going to face things they've never faced before. And therefore they need the people in their organization to be able to help them adapt to the world that's happening. And therefore they need these people um, who are constantly upgrading their skills, learning new things, being on top of things. So if you're a smart organization, you're going to make that investment. And then the government has an obligation to a degree, but I always get a little afraid because I'm not sure. I often think about our legislature is very important. Some of what's happening in the world is just so complicated that for a group of Mm. a couple hundred people to try to (laughs) legislate some of that stuff is a little challenging. I think that we can, though, the government has an obligation to think about programs that will encourage people and organizations to invest in education. There needs to be some level of investment in it overall. I think public schools certainly have been such an important thing to U.S. innovation and growth. And then I think they can probably do some things that will help encourage companies to invest. When I first started working, I worked at a company called Lotus, which paid for people to go get another degree. Mm. Organizations just don't do that much anymore, but they were very invested in helping the people who worked there continually grow and expand. It was a really amazing thing. And I just haven't seen that of late, perhaps because higher education got so expensive. (laughs) Perhaps. Yes. <laughs> um, absolutely. There's a lot of tension right now. I think maybe it, most likely because of economic factors. And this really comes down to the tension between the employee and employer in covering things. I've even gone personally as far to say is the employee employer relationship is broken in so many ways. How do you respond to the comment, the employee employer relationship is broken? And what do you attribute to your beliefs? Ooh, that's a very deep question, Drew. Personally, I'm not sure it's broken. It's never been perfect. It seems that the balance of power shifts. And I think what we would love to see is some very clear level of equality. Right now, I do think a lot of employees have 
power because the economy's been strong and it's hard to hire people, but that shifts, right? And sometimes when things aren't so great and there aren't a lot of jobs, then employees put up with a lot because they don't want to lose their job. They really feel like they need the income. So I'm not sure it's really broken so much as uh, it could be better. It generally works, right? I think even if you look at surveys of people's level of engagement at companies, it ebbs and flows, but it's not like everyone is completely unhappy with their job or the, the arrangement or how it's working. I do think there are some particular tensions right now, and it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. Work from home is one of them. Mm -hmm. The flexibility is one of them. I think we're going to see changes, but I don't think it's 100% broken. And, and part of the reason is that a lot of people I talk with are relatively happy with their career, their job. Yeah. Yes, there might be some things they would do a little differently, but they're not miserable. And so that gives me hope that it's not completely broken. Yeah. And I believe you're, and I look at it the same way. There's definitely a dynamic, right? Back and forth and ebb and flow between the leverage. Remote work is something that you just talked about. Beyond that, the transition to remote work as a business society was happening well before the pandemic. Pandemic accelerated that. I believe the same thing is true for freelance fractional work. Do you think it's possible to build a company 100% on freelance or fractional workers? Ooh, what another really great deep question. First of all, I believe almost anything is possible as long as it conforms to the laws of physics. No, just <laughs> I do. I Anytime someone says to me, you can't do, no company can do this or that. I'm like, ah, I don't know if I would say that. Now, is there any huge company that's done this? No, but I bet you we could find some that are a little bit smaller that perhaps have done it and managed it. I'm just a believer that anything is possible and it could make sense. When you think about it, a lot of agencies, there are a lot of agencies that are almost 100% fractional workers, right? Many of them get built in a way that they don't hire people permanently. Uber is built on fractional workers, right? Mm -hmm. Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, so many other businesses. And so there's something to that, that other businesses could probably learn from and therefore begin to adopt. There's good things about it and there's bad things about it. But I think the interesting thing that we've seen going back to this employer-employee relationship is the relationship with Uber might not be perfect, but when governments are trying to step in, a lot of the people who are these fractional Uber workers, they don't want that, right? The, the government's saying, we want to take care of you. So we're going to force Uber to make you an employee. And they're like, we don't want to be an employee of Ubers. <laughs> so it's been an interesting thing. So I think there's already some businesses that are largely built that way. Obviously, Uber has a large staff of permanent employees in their headquarters and in their management. But we see these pockets of businesses emerging this way. And with specialization, it can really make a lot of sense. Absolutely. One of the things that I appreciate about the freelance fractional movement is really what it's done to our perception of what a contract is and what a contractor is. Upwork as a platform recently announced that now you can do full-time contracts on their platform. There's also, in you know, correlating with this, what's happening in the economy, there's a rising trend of more union activity amongst the workforce. When you look at these factors, just curious to get your perspective, what do you think this says about the future of at-will employment? Yeah, which is, I'm sure there are other countries that have it. It's a little bit of a unique US mm -hmm. thing. I work with a lot of global companies. And sometimes when I'm speaking with people in Europe, for example, they don't really know that about the US. Sometimes they'll ask me questions and, blah, 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 and I'll say, let me tell you about something that's a little bit different in the US. And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, there's no safety net there. They're like, wow, I didn't, they don't, they're not really aware of it. I think contracting very often actually accelerates that because very often people want to put in the contract that they don't want to continue to work for you if they don't have to. They don't want to have to give you another 30 days just because they're under a contract and then often realize, okay, then I probably have to do the same. I, you know, I do a lot of contracts. I always have, uh, if we don't think it's working out, you can get rid of me. You just pay me for what I've already done. And, yeah. and I say, and I can change gears on you guys and I'll deliver on anything. I'm in the midst of, you know, 
promising to deliver on or whatever. So I think it could solidify it a little bit more. I think it's going to be a little bit more challenging in other countries that don't have this because it's a safety net that we're not used to. So we're not looking for it necessarily. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Thank you for your perspective. Shifting gears a little to performance measurement. As a space performance measurement, we have a lot of standards in our economy around job specifications, job requirements, job descriptions. We're woefully unsophisticated when it comes to performance standards. So you take an example of a product manager at a software company, same exact industry, and then you look at how is your performance measured? What are the outputs? You could have exact same roles effectively with totally different measures based on the business. And when we're looking at this shift to more human abilities, which were even more lacking as far as how to correlate to job performance, how do you think about performance measurement today? And how do you think that we'll have to evolve in the future to meet this reliance on human abilities? I think performance measurement is one of those love-hate things. And I worked at a company where we did annual and then we tried to go to continuous and we went back to annual. (laughs) Um, I think it's a little bit, it's so subjective still today. Perhaps it shouldn't be, but it really is. And that makes it hard sometimes for people to embrace fully is because it can feel very subjective. One manager might view someone one way and another views them another. So it's one of those things that's almost like a necessary evil. And I wish that it could be better, not just in being objective, but in giving people real tangible feedback that they can use. It's another, we talked about at employment, another, I don't know, again, if it's uniquely American, but we are some of the least direct people there are in the world. And we aren't very good at giving feedback. We just aren't. Everything is sugar-coated and maybe we dance around things. We avoid conflict. Not that we should be running into conflicts all the time, but people can't improve if they don't get real feedback. And I think too often performance reviews don't really give people that today. So going deeper on this thread with performance measurement, clearly, I think even if it's subjective in business, what we're trying to do is correlate the human performance to value delivery, right? And so how would you answer this question or help someone to process this question? What's the value of a human in the work context? So there is multiple levels, I think, of value. So one of course is some level of output. So the company says, what output do I want from this person and how much money is that worth to me? So there's a monetary value. Now, all this is happening in the background. It's not like we actually sit down with every role or at least nowhere else I've ever been where we've, this is going to be the output. We'll go back to our content writer. This is going to be the output of my content writer. And that is worth this because it's going to have this impact on the ROI of my business and my ability to return profits to my shareholders, which is going to drive my share price up. We don't really do that. Maybe we're doing that in our heads a little bit. In fact, we use a lot of benchmarking instead, mm. right? What should we ask other people? What should a content writer be able to do? And when we set those out and then we sit down and we do an agreement with them, right? We set quarterly objectives right. or annual objectives and we're like, this is the output. So there's always this monetary value. But then I think that there's also value we have to deliver to the person taking that flip side. And people work for a number of reasons. They work to live. They work because they do need money to live. They work for a sense of security, a sense of security that I know I'm going to have a continuing paycheck and not only am I going to be able to meet my needs now, but I'm going to be able to meet them in the future and take care of my family. And so there's all of that. There's a sense of belonging that I think many of us get from working, being part of a team, creating friends, belonging to potentially a cause. There's a sense of self-esteem for accomplishment and the outputs that we produce and what we, the impact we have and our capabilities. And maybe it gets to self-actualization, but probably not. But <laughs> right. All of that is part of the value equation, I think. And I think think employees, there's a monetary value, but I think companies are coming to the realization that they need to, beyond monetary value, they have to attend to some of these other values that employees are looking for. Yeah. And so we're in an age, I believe, of job accessibility, job mobility, 
there's a bit of a another sort of renaissance happening, almost an independence revolution for the worker, right? Saying, I want to choose a company that not just aligns with my values, but aligns with my career. And so this whole concept of what is the value and it's like, we measure it, but it's way more subjective than it is objective. Do you think that we will start to see more job standards performance standards emerge across companies if employees desire that? Or do you think that's, nah, I don't think we'll see that. I think we won't see it. And it's really, I think, because of how sprawling the work environment is. Another American value, right, is that value of independence and belief in myself. So maybe this is how everyone else measures that job, but I know something special and I'm going to evaluate people in a different way. If you just think about everybody who shares their interview questions, right? If you've read any Daniel Kahneman, yeah. he's, we all are really terrible at interviewing. Awful. Yeah. And we have have no idea how to hire. Yet, we have unbelievable and unwavering belief that the set of questions we ask are better than someone else's, right? And that we really know how to get to the heart of things and that we're better at hiring than others. I think for some of those reasons, it's hard to get standards. And I think it's also hard to get standards because even if you just think about the size of a business, let's go back to the content writer, the content writer at a really small company might not just write the content. They might have to format the content. They might have to design the content, right? So you look for somebody who is really strong at writing, but maybe can do those other things. And when you get into a very large company, the content writer really only does the writing because there's somebody else who does the design work and there's someone else who actually does the assembly of putting it together. Although AI will probably do all that for us in the future. But anyway, (laughs) so I think for those reasons too, it's hard to say this is what a content writer does because you then have to say, what does a content writer do in this context and in this context and in this context? So I think it's hard. I think it's really hard to do that, but we could certainly get better at it. And then going down this track of workers really wanting, I believe that as humans, we want to find work that aligns with our values and we want to be around those who share them right? That's just the thing naturally what we're doing about life. And I think we look for that in work. And so as we move about our career, career development services today, at least in the US, it's very much expected that I go to a company and the company subsidizes this for me, right? My management, my my career development. In that way, I think it's interesting because the business is the primary beneficiary of that transaction. They're likely not going to fund your education to go and do something if it's not related to the strategic direction of the company. I believe that is leading to a, a lot of pigeonholing, or I ended up in this path because that was the path that was afforded to me and not necessarily a path that was aligned with who I am and my values. And I never went through that exercise, actually. I'm, I think we're starting to see that change a little bit. There's also this concept, and actually right after, I'm, right after this conversation, I'm chatting with a, a recruiter. And talent agency recruitment doesn't serve the individual, it serves the business. It's really not talent agency, it's business agency. Do you think we'll start to see a shift perhaps with all that's happening and our reliance on humans and humans wanting to have control over their career to more career development services that are subsidized by the worker? I definitely think we could. And I think the maker economy, the freelance economy, that starts to have people think differently that they're working for themselves. And then when you're working for yourself and have been someone who made that switch, who used to work for a company, I realize now there's a lot of stuff I have to pay for (laughs) that used to be covered by my company. And so I think that the fact that we have the creators, the makers, the freelancers, they're already making some of these trade-offs and decisions. Mm -hmm. And the more that takes off, the more it'll become acceptable for you to make those investments in yourself. I think we've been conditioned generally not to. We go to school and that's either because it's free or our parents pay for it. Okay. Maybe the first time we start to pay for something ourselves is when we go to college and we take out loans Mm -hmm. and we start to say, oh, I I made an investment in myself. But then we go back and we work in a company. And as you said, we expect them to pay for those things. I want to take a class in XYZ. Will you cover it? Or I want to attend a conference to learn more. Will you cover it? And if they say, no, you can only go to one a year, we're pretty rarely going to go to more than one a year, right? So we're not used to investing in ourselves. But I think uh, those shifts in employment we were talking about previously are, are going to bring us a new set of people into the workforce who look at it as, 
I'm my own little business and I'm going to invest in myself. I love that. Carol, this has been an absolute delight. Is As we wrap up here, is there anything you want to share with the audience that maybe I didn't ask? Oh, that's another great question. <laughs> I think we covered a lot of ground. If there's anything to know, it might be helpful if anybody's listening to know. I do come at it with a little bit of an optimistic point of view. Yeah. So I definitely think there's going to be some downsides to every bit of technology we put out there, but I ultimately believe we're going to triumph. <laughs> that's fantastic. Carol, thank you. My pleasure.